We're going to move straight to our first session, which is with Dr. Elliot Fisherman from the Institute of Sustainable Transport. So Elliot has worked in transport innovation and sustainable mobility for almost two decades. He completed his PhD at the Centre for Accident Research and Road Safety. He's well known to councils, of course, as a leading advisor on electric vehicle charging, fleet transition, micro mobility and integrated transport strategies and much more. And you've probably been to um, one of his presentations before. But today he's going to talk to us and there it is. What is the most effective, sustainable role local government can play in enabling an effective charge network? So I'm just going to hand over to you, Elliot, and um, we've got about 15 minutes with you before we have questions. Thanks, Elliot. Okay. Excellent. Look, thanks very much. Um, this is a presentation that is time to actually go for closer to 25 or 30 minutes. So I'm going to move through some things quicker than others. Um, but um, I'll start off just giving you an overview. So I'm going to talk very briefly about EV basics and also um, EV charging and how we can segment up the network. So just as businesses will segment their market into different uh, quadrants or, or different categories, uh, you can do the same thing for EV charging, and I'll explain uh, why that's so important. Uh, and then I'm also going to address the issue of free charging. Uh, so that's charging at no cost to the user. And uh, that often gets a lot of local governments unstuck. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how you can um, get some clarity on that and get a policy that's uh, going to be most successful in meeting your needs uh, and the needs of that uh, challenge of transitioning to a zero emission fleet, at least cost to council. I'll also talk briefly about how to identify good locations for EV charging and how that differs depending upon the sort of user group that you're trying to meet, whether it be a local resident that doesn't have off-street car parking, uh, somebody that's looking for a top-up charge or somebody that's taking a long road trip and just wants to um, get a charge to get enough energy in their battery to get them to their uh, final destination. And I think perhaps most importantly, where does local government fit in on this? And I'll talk soon about uh, how local uh, EV charging hasn't really found its natural home within the architecture of local government. So I'll also start with the conclusions uh, because your attention is uh, probably at a heightened level now than what it might be uh, later on this morning. And also because uh, we may not actually get to the end of this presentation because it's not 15 minutes. So EV usage is growing and will continue um, as cheaper, more capable models become available. So we're about to see the influx of a large number of uh, fairly cheap uh, EVs coming in from China over the next 24 months or so, and that's going to substantially increase the take-up rate. And I mentioned before that it has, EV charging has no natural home in the same sort of way that um, bike parking or um, um, you know uh, off-leash dog areas all of these things, you know, there are things that have been with council for 30, 40 years, and then there are things that have been with council for only four or five years, and EV charging is one of those things that's still quite new. Some councils manage it through their climate change area, other councils manage it through, manage it through uh, car parking and compliance, and so there's a variety of different places where uh, councils manage EV charging, and often it can be a, a ball that kind of gets thrown around to different areas. Sometimes no one wants it, sometimes everybody wants it, and, uh, and it can be hard to manage for those reasons. It's also important to recognize that because we're talking about charging primarily in the public domain uh, for this presentation, it's worth keeping in mind that for about 90% of the charging that happens uh, overall in the national fleet, about 90% of that is gonna occur at home or at work, because that's the cheapest and most convenient place to charge an EV. And a lot of councils and also others feel as though fast charging is better than slow charging, but uh, our approach is rather than taking that view, it's about trying to match the charging speed with the typical duration of stay for different land uses. Um, so if you're staying at a place for three days, like I am at the moment in Swan Hill, I've just got my car charging up at a regular 10 amp power outlet. It takes 36 hours to charge, but it doesn't matter because I'm sleeping or I'm going out and doing things during the day while it's charging. So it's about picking the right speed for the right location. It's also really important to recognize that when councils provide free charging, that is no cost to the user, they limit the charging opportunities because 
you end up owning the market because you don't get the private operators coming in and offering charging because they can't compete with free. So they'll just go somewhere else. So you actually end up with a, a more constrained EV charging ecosystem than you would otherwise. And you can also distort transport choices because people will travel. It sounds silly that someone in an 80 or $90,000 car will uh, travel across town to get free charging, but they do. And when you look at the usage rates of the postcode of origin for uh, locations where they offer free charging, a lot of the cars that are charging there are actually registered in somebody else's local government area, not the local government that's providing the free charging. Our view is that councils should play a facilitator role rather than a, a funding role for this. So rather than councils uh, funding and owning these things, it's actually something that probably um, is best placed for the private sector, but there's still a very important role that councils have to play in trying to uh, create the design for the charging network. And because they own so much car parking and manage so much car parking, they're, they're at a pivotal role in terms of how they can influence the private sector to install charging in the public realm under a lease agreement. And so now more so than ever before, councils are able to extract the best outcome by exercising the competitive forces that are out there in the private sector at the moment, so that you can actually um, work towards some sort of cross subsidy model where you might have three sites that offer very high levels of latent demand for EV charging. They're really excellent locations, but you might also have some other locations that perhaps don't have that high level of expected demand, but for equity reasons or some other reasons, council would like to have charging installed in those locations as well. You can actually negotiate with the private sector and say, we'll give you these three very high value locations, but in return, you also need to provide charging in these lower value areas that's important for council, even if it might not necessarily make as much money. It's also very important for councils to understand that EV charging is actually complex. A lot of people think that it's easy because, well, there aren't very many moving parts. So, you know, how could it really go too far wrong? Well, it can go wrong. Poorly managed charging networks uh, suffer from a lack of uptime, that is uh, functional EV charging. And it's actually worse to have an EV charging station that doesn't work than none at all. So that's, that's really important as well. It's also really hard to make money off EV charging. So it's not a this kind of endless... Um, a stream of, of revenue where the revenue will always be more than the uh, cost of investing in that system. So that's incredibly important to understand. Uh, there'll be some locations where it will be profitable, but there'll be probably a lot more locations where it won't be uh, profitable. Um, just very quickly, uh, I know that for some of you that have come to a presentation of mine recently would have seen this chart. It just shows where Australia's transport emissions are tracking and that lower red line, uh, that vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal uh, red line is the 43% reduction target, which is what the uh, Commonwealth government has set uh, for us for 2030. So we have no chance of meeting that target, there, even if every single car purchased uh, for from tomorrow onwards was EV, we still wouldn't meet that target because of all of the other cars, the 99% of cars in our fleet that are currently internal combustion engine, and many of them have eight or nine or 15 years to go before they're uh, ready to be scrapped. Uh, this just looks at uh, vehicle fuel consumption over the years, over the last 50 years, and what it shows really is that fuel consumption hasn't really improved very much. So we're actually... Um, uh, haven't made as many gains as we could have. We've actually just made our cars a lot bigger. Uh, some of you will have just... seen this graph, so I don't think I need to labor on it, but this is just simply put it, the black balloons are the size of the emissions per person kilometer traveled. So the bigger the balloon, the more emissions. And then the footprints at the bottom is the space consumption. The reason this is important, because I know this forum is around four-wheeled electric vehicles, which implies that there's also lots of two-wheeled electric vehicles, and there are actually 96% of all electric vehicles are two-wheeled, not four-wheeled. Um, but it also shows the highly competitive um, uh, e-bikes and walking as well in terms of trying to reduce emissions and also reducing space consumption. So walking and cycling are the most effective in that, but walking and cycling aren't always the preferred modes for longer trips. And so we need to think about how we can convert the internal combustion engine cars to electric. But if we do all that, you can picture a, a congested street. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with a congested street that looks like this. If we were able to wave our magic wand and convert all of these cars to electric overnight, 
uh, then the situation that looks like this today would look like this. So it's basically exactly the same, except they don't have exhaust pipes. So it's, it's important, it's essential in fact, for reducing emissions, but if you only look at this, it, if you only look at electric vehicles as your solution to reducing emissions, you won't get there and you certainly won't get there within the time frame that's been outlined uh, by government. So it's all about doing more with less and creating the opportunities for people to choose the mode that uh, is best able to meet their needs at least cost to, from an environmental perspective and also a space consumption perspective, so doing more with less. This looks at the growth rate of EVs over time in Australia. So about 9%, almost 9% of all new cars sold last year were EVs. So we're getting there, but we had a fairly slow start. So compared to a few years ago, EVs have become cheaper. Uh, their range is longer. Uh, so maximum range now is around 600 uh, kilometres. And the uh, typical range for a new EV is about 400 kilometres. There's a wider variety of models. We're not seeing utes yet come in at any great volume, but that's something that will be occurring over the next two to three years. And we've got increased charging possibility. So there's heaps more chargers. I drove up to Swan Hill yesterday when I did the same drive in 2019. There were hardly any fast chargers. Now there were, I had um, a, a huge amount of choice in terms of where I charged. Uh, and that's because of the Victorian and Commonwealth government funding, uh, particularly a Victorian government funding that's enabled these chargers to, uh, to be installed. Just very quickly, in terms of the spectrum of different sorts of charging, uh, you can have everything from what I'm doing right now, as I mentioned before, just plug into an ordinary power point, that's a level one charge, right through to ultra fast charging where you can charge up a car in as little as 15 minutes. But in reality, most cars will never be able to do that because they can't accept that sort of speed because they don't have the right voltage architecture of the battery. But even the cars that do, they only accept that really high 350 uh, kilowatt rate for a small proportion of their overall charging cycle. So we often recommend doing a lot more 150 kilowatt hour charges and less 350 kilowatt charges because you'll end up being able to get three times as many uh, charging points if you focus on 150 compared to 350. So they're very expensive. Uh, 350 kilowatt charges can cost $700,000 for one charging port, which is not a great use of money. And as I mentioned before, 90% of charging happens at home. The real question for local government is what do we do about those people that live in homes where it's difficult to charge? And so this is what I was talking about before in terms of segmenting the market into different categories based on the typical duration of stay or their desired duration of stay. So you've got a passing through motorist, let's say you're traveling from Melbourne to Sydney, uh, you need a pull up because you've got 5% battery range and you know you're not gonna get to your final destination without a charge. You're on the side of the Hume Highway. You're not looking to spend a lot of time there. Uh, you might want to get a, a fast charge to get on your way as quickly as possible. Then you've got an opportunistic charger, which is really important for local government. So they're people like uh, they're people that charge their car in the same way that people often charge their mobile phone, uh, which is that you don't wait until your phone is at zero percent, but rather if you find yourself in a situation where it's convenient for you to charge your mobile phone, you'll just plug it in. You might be at 40 or 50 percent, but you know that if you plug it in now and charge, you won't have to charge later. And that's what an opportunistic charger is. So they're things like activity centers. Uh, so at the back of a town hall or at a, um, a supermarket car park in an activity center, these are charges where people were going to go there anyway and have their car parked. And they're si simply using that opportunity to charge up their car while they're doing something else. And then the third category is the local resident without uh, access to a charger. So that's someone that might live in the city of Port Phillip or the city of Stonington. Uh, they live in a terrace house. They don't have a place to park their car on site and they need to find a charging solution for themselves. This is another way of looking at it where you've got different sorts of land use. And so the, the color code of the legend is kind of a little bit um, uh, blocked here, but it's on the sporting over on the right hand side of the, the graphic. And it just shows you the, the speed of charge. I'll share all these slides uh, with, uh, with Greg from the MTF after this so that you can take a look at that in more detail. But what we're trying to do here is link the speed of charge with the typical duration of stay uh, so that we don't end up spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on really fast chargers when someone was gonna be there for eight or 10 hours and they could have got the same charging outcome um, with much less cost. We've, I'll rely on uh, the timekeeper to tell me when it's time because I don't wanna go over. Um, this is the 
selection criteria that we use for working out where to put opportunistic charges. So they're charges for people that are maybe going to spend between half an hour and two hours at a shopping centre or an activity centre. So the driver's going there anyway, close proximity to a diversity of different destinations so that people can do lots of different things. They can go to a cafe, they can go to a supermarket, uh, they can go to a library, a variety of different things. You need off-street parking typically. It's much easier to install EV charging in off-street car parking. You also want it close to fairly high volume roads as well, um, because that's basically the equivalent of footfall. You know, re uh, retailers often look at footfall, how many people are walking past the shop. High vol volume traffic roads are a good indicator of the busyness of a future charging station. And we also want to make sure that those people that are parking there are going to be there for around half an hour to two hours, because if any less than half an hour, you don't get an appreciable increase in the amount of charge. Uh, in your battery and anything more than two hours and you're better off going to a slower charger. So what role should local government play? A couple of minutes, Elliot. About yeah, two sure. or three minutes, thanks. Yep, no worries. So local government manage a large amount of public access car parks. That puts them in a good position to be able to help to facilitate a future charging network. And the commercial sector has developed a really strong appetite for investment they know how to get the state and government funding grants, and they're also um, buoyed by the fact that the EV ownership rate is really starting to increase, and that will increase uh, further uh, once we get to the 1st of January next year with the, uh, with the fuel efficiency standards coming into play. And so local government can, um, they can fill gaps uh, for where the commercial sector is unwilling to invest, but uh, there are lots of opportunities where the commercial sector is willing to invest, so doing them first and then uh, using that cross-subsidy approach that I mentioned right at the very beginning to try and fill those gaps uh, where the private sector might not be willing to invest. And local government can leverage, uh, and this is really what I was saying before, local government can uh, leverage that com those competitive forces in the market to, to get that cross-subsidy effect, so you're getting the charges where you need them. I might just finish um, on this slide or the one after it. This is just thinking about, well, what is breaking up EV charging from a local government perspective into there's the funding of EV charging, then there's the ownership of the asset, and then there's the operation. And I've broken it up into AC, which is slow charging, and DC, which is fast charging. AC is often, it's, it's going to be uh, slower to charge the vehicle, but it's also much cheaper. DC charging is very uh, fast, relatively but it is much more expensive. So for AC funding, for AC um, charging, the funding can come from a business owner that might want to, it might be a, a restaurant in, a, in an area that wants to put in some charges for their customers. So that it might cost two or $3,000 per charge. So it's not a huge amount of money, um, but, but it could also be local and state government uh, supply these. In New South Wales, there's a charging program for AC charging, uh, which is really well used. And for DC charging, the funding is going to have to come from state and Commonwealth government and increasingly the commercial sector is also willing to put up some of that money as well. In terms of ownership, uh, for AC charging, it would be whoever really installed it, uh, whoever covered the cost of it is usually the owner. Um, and for DC charging, the owner is often the CPO, which is charge point operator, uh, a business site, or a DNSP, which is the people that own the, power, the poles and wires. Uh, and for the operation, for AC charging, it's the business. For DC charging, it's usually the charge point operator. And that's really important because these are things that um, benefit from scale. So it's much easier for a charge point operator that manages 500 charge points. The amount of work they need to do is about the same as somebody that just manages six charge points. So it's actually um, benefits from scale. So there's a handful of businesses that specialize in this, and they're much better able to uh, remotely manage the network and do all the kind of technical and complex things that a charge point operator, uh, th that an operator would need to do in order to make sure the uh, charges are operating effectively. Um, I'm actually just going to go past a lot of this and just focus now in the last minute or so on what to do for residents that don't have off-street car parking. So our recommendation is, is kind of this three, four-step approach of you find the cluster of housing typologies, you can use the census to do this, that makes it difficult to um, charge off street. So that's like terrace houses and apartments that, um, that can be complex to install charging in. 
you want to find a place that's close to where residents would typically park overnight. So somewhere either in their street or one street over, you know, maybe 200 metres from their, their final, um, their residential address. You're looking for places where you can install either curbside or off street, but off street is better because the charging port on vehicles is in different parts, depending upon the model of car. So it makes it hard for curbside sometimes because the court has to reach over to the other side of the car for some vehicles, but not for others. Whereas off street, you can kind of reverse in and go nose in or tail in depending upon uh, the, the configuration of your car and where your charge port is. And we've often recommended a demand responsive system. So rather than trying to pick a needle in a haystack and go, oh, well, we think there's gonna be demand here, better off getting requests from residents and then looking for where there are clusters of requests where you might have 20 or 30 requests all in one block or within you know, uh, a radius of three or 400 meters, that would be the place where you, you might wanna install EV charging if all the other factors are met. Um, and this is just uh, some of the examples of ways in which you can meet that uh, demand for uh, EV charging on street. Uh, these are curbside. It doesn't have to be curbside, of course, but this is some of the examples from different parts of the world where, where that's been done. So look, I might pause there uh, so that we've got plenty of time uh, for questions. And in the slide set that I'll send through, um, there'll be some other slides that I didn't get to talking about today. Great. Thanks, Elliot, so much for sort of whizzing through that. Um, there's a lot in there. And um, yes, I mean, I've definitely learned a number of things, but particularly that one around, you know, how you get equity in that cross subsidy by saying, yep, well, yes, you can have the, the high uh, value sites, but we'd also like you to put some over here as well. So that's great. Now, it doesn't look like there's any questions in the chat, and I'm just going to do a quick zoom through. I don't know if anyone's got their hand up, but it doesn't look like. Does anybody have a question for Elliot? You may possibly still be processing all of that information. Um, Jane, you've got one? Uh, yes, just to get the ball rolling, Elliot. Um, um, would, how would you place Victoria compared to other states when it comes to uh, the sorts of infrastructure that we have? Are we um, leading the pack, behind the pack, in the middle? Um, just some comments from there, if you could, please, Elliot. Yeah, sure. So I think the Electric Vehicle Council have uh, like a report card that uh, where they rate each of the Australian jurisdictions. And I think Victoria gets around a six out of 10, uh, whereas ACT and New South Wales are hovering around nine, eight or nine out of 10. And I think the reason why Victoria doesn't perform quite as well as some of those uh, other jurisdictions is because uh, we don't have as strong a policy on and funding program for EV charging. It's not differentiated enough as well in terms of um, uh, funding for apartments, uh, funding for destination charges where you might get um, a country town where you put in 11 kilowatt charges or um, at uh, at, at businesses, off it's as far as I can tell, it's restricted really to DC charging, and uh, the scale of the charging stations as well are often uh, fairly small. Partly that's just the artifact of when uh, these schemes were devised four or five years ago, and the demand wasn't there. Uh, but some of the places that they've installed charges don't offer any opportunity for expansion. And one of the criteria that we often recommend for councils is when you're recommending a spot, consider whether there are opportunities for expansion or not, because if you can't expand it, then it may not make sense uh, five or six years down the track. I think we've also got a fairly antiquated um, policy on the plug type. So uh, in, in broad terms, there's two sorts of DC charging plugs. There's Chetamo, which only a very small number of uh, Japanese vehicles use, and then everybody else, so 98% of all the other cars use the CCS plug. And we've got a 50-50 split in Victoria, even though less than 2% of all charging stations at DC charging use the chat ammo plug. So we've basically halved the productivity of our charging stations because of our commitment to a plug that has no future. Uh, so, uh, and the federal government has now said that they won't, uh, they won't fund charges where uh, there's that 50-50 split. They wanna see about 75% of all the plugs being CCS. And chat ammo, if you're going to do it at all, could only um, uh, form 25% or so. So I think there's a lot more that Victoria could do to help catch up to uh, uh, at the ACT in New South Wales, for example. Thanks, Elliot. I'm on mute. You're on mute, Bernadette. 
sorry, sorry. We've got three questions and three minutes. So I'm going to throw to Vincent from Kingston. Hi, Elliot. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Always very insightful. And um, yeah, really interesting to hear too about your recommendations for um, AC charging, uh, particularly for on street. Um, you know, certainly know that in, in in Europe, that's a big part of the equation, given the mix as well of of, of greater density, of course, in and housing typologies. It's something that we're looking very closely at as well, particularly around the densification of some of our major activity centers. Uh, and planning for those changes in parking reform that are coming down the pipeline for for less parking in areas where there's good transport access. Um, what do you think is the opportunity and also some of the challenges for thinking through um, encouraging that transition, but also working with car share operators so that ultimately we're not also encouraging so many vehicles on the road as well for EV charging and AC on street specifically? Yeah, so one of the main barriers to people taking up EVs, the main one is cost, cost of the EV itself, but also people are concerned about charging infrastructure. Often that concern becomes less once people actually get an EV because they're then motivated to look at websites like PlugShare and they become familiar with a whole lot of charging opportunities that they weren't aware of before. So um, charging is one of those things that you don't really see unless you need to see it. Um, so so that that's, I think, really important to uh, recognise. Um, uh, what was the second part of your question? Sorry, Vincent. Uh, it was really around the opportunities and challenges for working with car share oh, yes, operators okay. to install, yeah. you know, EV charging on street, for example, so that yeah, yeah people that, people have that option essentially of not having to own a car. Yeah, look, I think that's it makes a lot of sense for uh, car share operators to do that, but it doesn't make a lot of financial sense for the car share operators themselves to do that until we've reached a point of price parity. So it doesn't cost any more for a car share operator to buy an EV. So something like a Clean Energy Finance Corporation bridging the gap between the difference between their regular cars that they provide compared to a similar sort of model, but as a zero emission uh, uh, form of transport, an EV, I think would make a lot of sense. And it would also help, I think, to encourage people to uh, give EVs a, a try that haven't uh, previously. So I might just leave the answer there because I know that we've got a couple of other questions that I want to get to. Yeah, look, we've actually run out of time and we've got a very hard time limit with one of our other presenters. So can I ask, um, Elise, I know you had a question. Do you want to, could you pop that in the chat and we might pass. If anybody else has questions that they thought of for Elliot, Jane can pass those over to you, Elliot, if that's okay. And apologies, we've had to... Um, really stick to time this morning. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, and sharing your expertise and research and, and um, experience of this. We really do appreciate um, your time. So thanks again for joining.